many, many thanks to Vaughn and Lou and David and for that. And also I'm, I neglected to thank uh, Jenny Giddens who stepped in as our liturgist today. So thank you all, all of you very much for helping to lead us in worship. Hyperbole is a form of exaggeration used in speech. It's like when we say, I'm so hungry I can eat a horse. And couples will often use hyperbole when they're arguing, right? You always forget to take out the trash, or you never listen to me. And even Jesus, though, used hyperbole to make a point. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now, of course, Jesus doesn't mean for us to take this literally. What he is saying, though, is pay attention to what I'm saying because it's that important. So it may not be literally true, but it's true enough that we should listen to what he is saying. Such is hyperbole. So let us listen for the truth in what Jesus has to say, for this is God's truth to each of us this day. And Jesus said, You have heard that it was said by the men of old that you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment, and whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. And so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go and first be reconciled with your brother. And then come and offer your gift. Make friends quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to his guard shall put you in prison. For truly I say to you, you will never get out till you have paid the last penny. This is the word of the Lord. God. Years ago, there was a young woman in my church named Morgan Evans, and Morgan played the bagpipes. And I was so impressed that this high schooler would learn such a difficult instrument. And she would play it in worship. It was so demanding of an instrument. And after she'd play it, she'd often say things like, uh, I nailed it. Or if she messed up, she said, that was awful. Or, boy, did I really mess that one up. And of course, most of us who are listening had no idea when she was playing it the way she was supposed to be or not playing it the way she was supposed to be. But she did, right? And although it didn't make a big difference to me when she failed to hit the note perfectly, I'm glad it made a difference to her because I suspect if it didn't matter to her that eventually even I would notice. It's important to care that things are the way they are supposed to be. The sculptor and painter Michelangelo once said this, nothing makes the soul so pure, so religious as the endeavor to create something perfect. For God is perfection, and whoever strives for perfection strives for something God-like. And I think he is right. Perfection is when things are the way they're supposed to be. And sin is when things are not the way they are supposed to be. And what can be devastating is when we lack an ear for wrong notes. Or we can't play the right notes. Or even recognize those right notes in the performance of others. Because if we can't identify sin, we become morally and ethically tone deaf. So much that we miss the greater music of grace. And it's one of the problems of our time. Maybe it's always been a problem, of course, but it seems so often that many people are unable to recognize sin when they see it. They are unable to hear it 
too fearful to name it. In the movie Grand Canyon, Kevin Klein uh, is coming home and he takes a shortcut through the city to get there and he finds himself in a dangerous part of town when his car breaks down. So he manages to call a tow truck, but while he's waiting there, these five thugs approach him and start to threaten him. Well, the tow truck driver, played by Danny Glover, he arrives uh, just in time, and as he starts to hook up uh, Klein's car, the five thugs tell the driver to just get lost. Well, Glover, character, takes the leader of the gang aside, and here's what he says to him. Man, he says, this ain't the way it's supposed to work. Maybe you don't know that, but this ain't the way things are supposed to be. I'm supposed to be able to do my job without asking you if I can. And that dude is supposed to be able to wait for his car without you ripping him off. Everything is supposed to be different than the way it is here. Sin is when things are not the way they're supposed to be. And of course, to say things are not supposed to be one way suggests that they're supposed to be another way. And the Hebrews called the way things are supposed to be shalom. That's the way things are supposed to be. Now our Bible often translates that word shalom as peace. But shalom is more than a peace of mind or the absence of war. Shalom is when people are getting along and exhibiting respect for one another. That's the Hebrew's image for the way things are supposed to be. Shalom is when justice rolls down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's the target. The theologian C.S. Lewis said the fact that we all yearn to have things the way they are supposed to be is actually proof for God. Because Lewis says even though cultures have a different perspective on certain things like in France they may drink wine for breakfast, in Germany they drink beer for lunch, and in Indiana you have pork tenderloins for supper. But beyond what is unique to our cultures, Underneath it all, there are universal truths in which we all agree no matter where you go in the world, that murder is wrong, stealing is wrong, lying is wrong. And Lewis says we wouldn't have this shared sense of a right unless there was a right out there for which we yearn. For if you follow rivers far enough, they all lead to the ocean. And if you follow our desires for right and wrong back to their source, they all lead to God. And that is what leads us to the Gospel of Matthew because Jesus is telling us the way things are supposed to be. When you come to the altar and remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar. First be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now I can only imagine that if we took that passage literally what it would look like here on a Sunday morning. We'd rarely have time to worship because no sooner than we'd sit down than someone would have to get up and say, you know what, I just remembered. Someone has something against me and I have to leave. We have to install revolving doors at the sanctuary because it would be pandemonium. Because I suspect none of us sitting here, or all of us sitting here, better said, all of us can think of someone who has something against us. And so we would never have time to do anything except leave. But notice something also unique about what Jesus says. He doesn't say this. If you realize you have something against someone else, go and be reconciled and first come back. That isn't what he says. He doesn't say that because truthfully that might be easier. It might be hard for me to realize I have something against someone and that I need to make amends with them. That might be hard. But it's much harder 
for me or for us to approach someone that we suspect has something against us. Because those are the people we avoid, aren't they? Don't we consciously stay clear of the people we have something against or someone has something against us? Because who wants to go to someone who has something against us because they'll only remind us of why they don't like us to begin with. So of course we don't particularly want to do that. I find it much easier if I'm upset with someone to tell them I'm sorry than to approach someone who doesn't like me because I don't want to deal with that. It's hard, just like so many of the other things Jesus asks us to do are hard. Don't hang on to angry feelings. Don't harbor lust, lustful thoughts. Don't cast the first stone. But here is what we need to realize. Jesus, by saying what he says, is showing us the bullseye. The way things are supposed to be. And he knows full well how hard it will be for us to hit it and how impossible it is for us to hit it perfectly. And yet if we don't have a sense of the way things are supposed to be, then we'll do nothing well. A few years ago, a Ku Klux Klan came to visit where I lived. And it was a little bit upsetting to my church, but I tried to reassure them saying, keep in mind that the Klan is just an example of a group of people who have given up. Although they like to say they're Christian, the fact of the matter is they've thrown in the towel on Christian faith. It's the second inning and they're ready to walk off the field or even worse, burn down the stadium. It's almost like they're saying, you know, it's just too hard to love, so we're going to give up. It's too strenuous to accept diversity. It's too demanding to keep our anger out of our hearts. It's too unrealistic to believe the kingdom of God is real, so we give up on all that. We have chosen to pander to hate and rely on suspicion because it's so much easier than aiming for God's will. And of course they're right, really. It's so much easier to just toss the darts and not bother to aim to hit the target, to not try. Just throw them and if they land in someone's eye, well that person should just go back to Africa or Mexico or they should just become hateful like we are. Because it's just too hard to aim for God's will. But that's not a good enough response, is it? Saying it's too hard, so we give up. Because it's hard for all of us here this morning. All of us are having it hard to follow Christian faith and hit the mark perfectly. And we aren't here for sure because we've got it all figured out. I can confess before you today that I fail every week and often I fail on days in a row. But I am here and we are here because we admit that we have played the wrong notes. We are here to remind ourselves though that there's a difference between the din of sin and the music of God. And it's important for us to know which is which. Because if we don't know the difference, or pretend there isn't a difference, then as Jesus said, it will be like being in jail and someone has thrown away the key. But what a blessing it is to aim for the music of God because when we aim every now and then we hit it and what a blessing that is to find out the way things are supposed to be. In the uh, magazine Presbyterians Today, often every edition has stories of Presbyterians who have tried to hit the mark and have gotten really close. 
One example was a man named Roland Stewart. As a young teenager, he used to sneak into his church. He was a Native American on a reservation. He'd sneak into his church and taught himself to play the piano, and now he plays for worship every Sunday. There's a story of Amanda Massey, who was a 17-year-old girl who established a, a chapter for Habitat for Humanity in Georgia at her college. And there's the story of Bill and Paula Boston, actually two people I know in Louisville who were wheelchair bound since they had polio as young people, who've done all kinds of things to help people in their community. And I can remember there was a snowstorm back in Louisville a few years ago, and Paula was saying that they had a neighbor who came by to see if they're okay, you know, they're in the wheelchair, see if they needed help getting their car out. And when Paula answered the door to tell the neighbor, she said, oh, thank you, but Bill is, is down the road helping a neighbor dig his car out of the snow. And there was a story of something that happened during the passing of the peace in a service of worship where folks in the congregation knew that there was two men who were deeply at odds about something. And during the passing of the peace, one man made his intentional beeline all the way across the sanctuary to shake hands with the man he had disagreements with because that is the way it's supposed to be. Was that easy to do? I bet you not. But it was the way things are supposed to be. And that, of course, is why IPC supports ministry to help the homeless. That's why we provide meals at Thanksgiving. That's why we open our doors to refugees. We give money to School 57. And just a couple weeks ago, a group of our church went to the Appalachian to help people with build homes because that's the way things are supposed to be. And so our closing prayer might be this. O oh Lord, teach us the right notes to play. Teach us to, the courage to know when we're playing the wrong notes. And Lord, may our music bring harmony to the world you love. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.